If you were stranded on an uncharted island full of massive prehistoric creatures that could kill you in the blink of an eye, what would you do? This team of soldiers and scientists have just made a discovery that could change the world as we know it. But first, they'll have to live to tell the tale, and it's not going to be easy. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, <laughs> and how to survive the prehistoric death machines in Kong Skull Island. These explorers are about to find out what it's like to be back at the bottom of the food chain. At the end of the war in Vietnam, researcher Bill Ronda, the head of a top secret government organization called Monarch, travels to the capital in search of funding for his next expedition. They're hoping to catch a flight to the legendary Skull Island, convinced that what they might find there could lead to incredible scientific breakthroughs. After reminding the senator that they wouldn't want opposing countries to get there first, he finally agrees to fund the trip. But that was their biggest mistake. They'll be escorted by an Army aviation unit led by Lieutenant Colonel Packard, who's been having some trouble coming to terms with the end of the war, and eagerly accepts the new assignment despite knowing the risks. While Parker prepares his men, Rhonda and his partner, geologist Houston Brooks, recruit expert tracker James Conrad who can help them survive in the jungle in case things go wrong, and boy, are they going to. Finally, there's photographer Mason Weaver, who's joined up because she thinks that there's more to the story of Skull Island than the officials are willing to tell. The island is surrounded by a never-ending storm that makes reaching it by boat impossible, but their plan is to use the army helicopters to break through. After dropping seismic charges to study what lies below the island, they're going to land for a ground expedition that will last for three days, until they finally regroup for extraction on the north shore. With anyone who misses the chopper out risking being left behind for good, the choppers manage to get through the storm by the skin of their teeth, and on the other side, they're met with one of the most breathtaking views that any of them has ever seen. But it isn't long before their apocalypse now moment is brought to an abrupt end. No sooner do they start dropping charges than one of the helicopters is taken down by a whole ass flying tree. They've officially gotten Kong's attention, and he is pissed. One by one, he starts swatting down the choppers like flies, with the fire from their heavy machine guns barely leaving a scratch. The soldiers scramble to get control of the situation, but they do about as well as an army of ants going up against a battleship, with all of their aircraft destroyed and more than half of the men already dead. As Kong marches away into the valley. Okay, well, that didn't take long. Kong here just took out that entire helicopter unit without so much as breaking a sweat. It looks like Packard and his men are in just a bit over their heads with this one. They need to get things under control and fast before the rest of them end up listed as missing in action. But from the looks of it, that's gonna be much easier said than done. Let's be real. Attack helicopters armed with heavy machine guns would pretty much make you the top banana just about anywhere on Earth. When you come to Skull Island, you have to go through the king, and he didn't get that title by accident. Packard and his men might feel equipped to hold their own in any situation, but Kong here is unlike anything known to modern science. Kong is a giant ape, most closely resembling a silverback gorilla in appearance and behavior. And when I say giant, I mean giant. Put it this way, even your average everyday gorilla is nothing to sneeze at, with some of the largest males on record having reached an impressive six and a half feet tall and tipping the scales at nearly 600 pounds. But Kong here makes even the most swole silverback look like a minnow swimming next to a megalodon. And that comparison still hardly does him justice. Ready to be impressed? While Jason Statham's mortal enemy only reached a measly 50 feet long, and 50 tons in weight, this version of Kong stands at a preposterously massive 100 feet tall and weighs nearly 350,000 pounds, putting him closest in size to an adult blue whale, the largest species of animals to have ever existed. What makes things even crazier is that the Kong we see here is only an adolescent, meaning that he's still growing up, and by the time that he reaches his full potential, he'll be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Godzilla himself. So, 
If you end up on his bad side, there's nothing much else to say besides, it's been nice knowing ya. His enormous size naturally comes with unbelievable strength, with Kong's mighty fists boasting a crushing force of up to 150 tons, which, as we've just seen, is enough to crumple a US Army helicopter like a freaking soda can. He may be a tank, but life in the mountains of Skull Island has also given him the agility of an Olympic gymnast on steroids. He can leap between mountainsides with ease and uses this ability to hold his own in battle, even when outnumbered by insanely aggressive opponents. If you're trying to harm him, then you're really going to need to break out the heavy artillery because he's able to withstand a concentrated barrage from the chopper's M16 machine guns without taking so much as a scratch. In fact, the only thing that did seem to hurt him was the chopper's propeller blades, and even that didn't look like much more than a paper cut. Kong's not just a brawler, but a thinker as well. Like his real-life counterparts, Kong has an impressive, almost human level of intelligence, giving him the ability to fight strategically, change plans on the fly, and even use tools by turning objects in the environment into weapons to supplement his already incredible strength. All that is to say, your best and pretty much only chance to survive a battle with Kong is to avoid ever getting into one in the first place, which is exactly what Colonel Packard and his men should have done. In reality, Gorillas don't go around just looking for a fight. They typically only attack as a means of self-defense when they feel threatened, and Kong here is no different. While they're certainly capable of holding their own in a fight against pretty much anything, their intelligence makes them prefer to resolve conflicts by communication, not violence. Still, that doesn't mean that you should walk up to one and try to give it a belly rub, but if you keep a respectful distance and mind your manners, then you shouldn't really be in any danger. When Packard and his unit started dropping bombs on the island, Kong here felt like he was under attack, which is why he chose to retaliate by destroying their helicopters. They don't know it yet, but their seismic charges also awoke something even more dangerous than Kong himself. Another reason why he felt like he needed to stop the choppers as soon as he could. Instead of escalating the situation, Parker should have immediately ordered his troops to pull back and observe Kong from a safe distance to see if he really is a threat. After all, they are in helicopters and could simply have flown right out of his range. Kong could have easily killed them all after destroying their vehicles, but instead he chose to leave once he thought that the threat was managed, which should tell you everything that you need to know when it comes to his true intent. Tensions. The truth is that the best way to beat Kong isn't going to be to fight him at all, but instead to learn to coexist with him peacefully. He can easily kill you if he has the mind to, but if you can find a way to communicate that you aren't a threat, he can also be an incredibly powerful ally. And they're going to need his help to get off this island, even if they don't realize it yet. Now, let's say that despite getting absolutely stomped during their first encounter, Packard and the others are still looking for a fight. If you ask me, that's a pretty damn bad idea, but there's two possible approaches that they might want to take. In the wild, gorillas build nests where they spend an average of 12 hours per day sleeping, so they could try attacking him with explosives while he's down for a snooze. Option two is to get him while he's eating. Wild gorilla diets mostly consist of leaves and other types of foliage. If they can find an area of the island that's rich in these types of resources, then they could try setting a trap for Kong and ambushing him when he stops for a bite. Honestly, picking a fight with this guy is only gonna get you a one-way ticket to Suplex City, so I wouldn't risk it. Their best bet here is to regroup, keep a low profile, get to the North Shore ASAP, and then wait for their ride off of the island. Because Kong isn't the only threat living in the jungles, which they're about to find out the hard way. After the battle, the expedition finds themselves split into two groups, with one team of survivors led by the tracker and the other by Packard. One of the pilots, Major Chapman, has crash landed alone up in the mountains, but is able to make contact with the colonel over the radio. His chopper was carrying a bulk of their heavy weapons, so Packard and his 
men set out to find him, determined to bring Kong down by any means necessary, as revenge for their fallen comrades. Before leaving, Packard confronts Rhonda, demanding to know the truth about what's really going on here. It turns out that he was the only survivor from a shipwreck that was attacked by an ancient species of monster from this island, but the tragedy was covered up and hidden from the public. His real goal all along has been to prove that these monsters really exist so that the military can take action before they escape and destroy civilization as we know it. The geologist Brooks explains that the area under the island is actually full of massive hollow chambers where these creatures live, which is how they've gone undetected for so long. As they're trekking through the valley, they encounter a massive water buffalo the size of a two-story house that emerges from the lake just yards away. The explorers are about to shoot, but Conrad tells them to hold their fire and the beast peacefully lumbers away. It looks like not everything on the island is hostile. But where there's prey, there are predators, and it's only a matter of time before they meet the creatures at the top of the food chain. While Packard's team is creeping through a bamboo forest, one of them is suddenly impaled by a massive stick that's really the leg of an enormous wandering arachnid, and it's hunting them for food. The men immediately open fire with their machine guns, but it reaches down with these disgusting suction cup-like tentacles and begins pulling one of them up towards its jaws. Unable to get a clear shot, they instead begin hacking the creature's legs off with their machetes, and the soldier manages to cut himself free with his knife just in time. Now they open fire on the creature once again, this time bringing it down as Packard finishes it off with his sidearm. It's a terrifying encounter, and for the soldiers, reality begins to sink in that they won't all be making it out of this alive. Okay, that was crazy. Kong is impressive enough on his own, but we've just gotten our first look at two more species of megafauna living here on the island, one prey and the other predator. Not everything that lives here wants to eat you, but some of them definitely do. So let's take a moment to look at each encounter and see what kind of strategies that we can come up with that might increase our chances of survival going forward. The first group had it easy. They were lucky enough to come across a giant species of herbivore called a skier buffalo. Despite its size, they didn't even know it was there until they were right on top of it because of how well they've evolved to blend in with their environment, something that we'll come back to in a minute. The second team, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. They met a mother long legs, a species of giant carnivorous arachnid that stalks the island's forest hunting for live food. These eight-legged freaks may not be as dangerous as Kong, but they can certainly do some damage, especially if they catch you by surprise. With species this huge, it's going to be tough to outrun them, and any fight, although winnable, is going to leave several men dead at best. The most important thing to notice here is what each of these creatures have in common, and that is their highly developed camouflage. Now, in the natural world, camouflage is a defense mechanism used by animals to blend in with their environment, either as a means to avoid being spotted by predators like the buffalo or getting the jump on unsuspecting prey like the spider. Camouflage doesn't need to be purely visual either. Some species also opt to cover up their scent, since smell is one of the most highly tuned senses used by predators and prey animals alike. The survivors here should take a page out of these species' books and use camouflage to make themselves more difficult to detect. They could try rolling around in some mud, which would not only help them blend in visually with their natural surroundings, but also mask their scent. For extra creativity points, they could try covering themselves in the blood and viscera of the dead mother longlegs, since smelling like a predator is a great strategy for keeping other predators away. The mother longlegs here are arachnids, and most arachnids actually have fairly poor eyesight, hunting instead by feeling their prey's movements through their heightened sense of touch. If they encounter one again, they should avoid making any sharp movements and possibly try throwing something like a rock or grenade in the opposite direction as a way to possibly distract the creature so that they can escape. If all else fails, you can always let the others panic first since the creature will be attracted to their movements and use them as a meat shield so that you can get away. The best thing that they can do for now though is try to remain undetected. 
this island is a literal death trap that time forgot. But if they move carefully and avoid drawing too much attention to themselves, then they just might make it to the North Shore in one piece. Sometime later, Conrad's party discovers these ruined stone structures with strange yellow markings all over the walls. Before they even know what's coming up, a group of local warriors appear and quickly surround them, leading to a tense standoff that could turn deadly at any moment, until suddenly, an American who looks like Tom Hanks from Castaway comes running out to calm things down. It's Lieutenant Hank Marlowe, a pilot who crash landed on the island during a battle nearly 30 years ago, and he's been living among the warriors ever since. Overjoyed to finally reunite with people from his home country, he explains that Kong isn't the only dangerous creature on the island, and tells them to follow him to safety before nightfall unless they want to meet the others. Meanwhile, Chapman here is still waiting for a rescue, and decides to go down to the river to refill his canteen, having no idea that sudden death is lurking just below the water's surface. He's washing the blood from his face when, all of a sudden, Kong comes strolling in from behind the mountain, walking straight towards him, which forces Chapman to hide out behind a nearby rock. While getting a drink of his own, Kong senses something heading his way, and that's when he reaches into the water, pulling out a massive tentacle. It's a giant squid, big enough to take down an entire aircraft carrier, but Kong easily tears it limb from limb and begins slurping up its arms like he's down at the Olive Garden enjoying a never-ending bowl of spaghetti. Because on Skull Island, when you're here, you're family. With Chapman looking on, Kong drags the rest of the creature away as a snack for later, leaving the man unharmed. But there are even worse things out there than a giant squid, and they're going to come for him soon enough. Okay, that was a damn close call for Chapman here. A few more seconds at the riverside and Squidward would have been having him for lunch. He's incredibly lucky that Kong showed up when he did. Otherwise, he would have been well on his way to Davy Jones's locker, which actually gives me an idea. There's a common saying that goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and that's exactly the approach that we're going to take. By now, it's painfully obvious that the island is full of unbelievably deadly creatures, but Kong here seems like he can handle just about any of them with relative ease. Most of these creatures probably want to stay out of his way, so it might be a good idea to quietly follow him, as long as he's going in the right direction, essentially using him as a giant meat shield to keep the larger predators away. As long as you can avoid accidentally getting stepped on, you can use Kong's position as the dominant species on the island to your advantage, and make your way to the North Shore with his help, even if he isn't actually aware that he's helping you at all. It's a better plan than trying to survive on your own, so if I were Chapman, I'd consider tagging along with the big guy as a sort of bodyguard to keep the nastier creatures in check. Marlowe brings them to the warrior's home, a village deep in the valley that's protected by giant wooden walls on all sides. But Kong isn't the only one who they're trying to keep out. The truth is that Kong was once just one member of an entire species of giant apes who the warriors worshipped as gods and protected them from the other dangerous creatures on the island. He mostly keeps to himself and only attacked their helicopters because they were dropping bombs on his land, which woke up something that even Kong is afraid of, a terrifying species of subterranean amphibian-like creatures called skull crawlers that killed off Kong's entire family many years back. You see, Kong can handle these creatures when they're young, but there's an even larger one still lurking in the caverns. And if anything should happen to him, the monster will rise to the surface once again, killing everyone on the island. Okay, this is not good. Just one battle with Kong wiped out all of their choppers and half of their men. So if there's a species on the island that can take him in a fight, then they're going to want to avoid running into them at all costs. These hyper-aggressive, tunnel-dwelling amphibians known as skull crawlers compete with Kong for the dominant position on the island. Like most creatures here, they are absolutely massive, with the smallest ones standing over 12 feet tall, while the largest ones are as big as Kong himself. They're no lightweights either, tipping the scales at anywhere from 40 to a whopping 100 tons. Their titanic strength makes them more than a match for our buddy Kong. 
but they're also incredibly fast and agile, which means that outrunning one is going to be all but impossible once it's got you in its sights. Worst of all, they're highly intelligent, setting up ambushes for their prey and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. The skull crawlers sometimes even employ pack hunting strategies, which means that when you see one, the other one is probably right behind you. That's a whole lot of nope running around on two legs. So I guess the most important question here is how the hell do you fight one of these things if you aren't a 100 foot tall gorilla? Well, in a fair fight, uh, you're not gonna stand much of a chance, but there are some options if you're willing to get creative. When faced with such a powerful creature, the best bet is to focus on attacking its weak points. They use those two creepy legs to get around, so I'd suggest focusing their fire on its joints to slow it down, because if it can't chase you, then it probably can't eat you either. The skull crawlers also have a prehensile tail and tongue that they use to grapple with whatever they're fighting. Grab a sharp object to slice off its tongue and you take out one of its primary methods of attack. Before it can eat you, it needs to find you first, so going after its senses can also be a viable strategy. If possible, I'd try attacking its eyes to blind it so that I could escape. Like some species of snake, they also use the pits on the front of their snout to sense infrared thermal radiation when hunting their prey. So damaging these pits with gunfire or explosives could make it harder for the creature to track you. The best option of all would be to take them out before the fight even starts. We know that the skull crawlers make their burrows in the tunnels under the island, so if you strategically cave in the tunnel entrances, then you might be able to trap them inside. Finally, their heightened metabolism gives them an insatiable appetite, which means that you could try setting a trap by making it look like there's an easy meal, and then ambushing them when they go in for the kill. But as ambush predators themselves, they're usually too smart to fall for something like this, as we'll soon see firsthand. Conrad explains that they're trying to reach the North Shore before the extraction team arrives, which Marlowe says would be impossible on foot, but as luck would have it, he just might be able to help them out. His old fighter may never fly again, but that doesn't mean that it can't float. When they realized that they were trapped on an island full of monsters, Marlowe and his unlikely friend, a Japanese pilot named Gunpei, decided that instead of trying to kill each other, they should work together to get the hell out of there, and began repurposing the parts from their planes into a homemade raft. He lost his friend to the skull crawlers before they could finish, but now that Conrad and his people are there, if they can help him finally get it running, then they can ride it upriver to the extraction point. While the others are busy fixing up the boat, Mason goes around taking photos of the warriors and their village, until she hears something that gets her attention. Just outside the wall, she finds one of the giant water buffalo crying out in distress after being pinned down by a crashed helicopter. Although she desperately tries to help, there's no way that she could move the heavy wreckage by herself, but lucky for the buffalo, there's someone who can. Just then, Kong appears and lifts the chopper up with ease, setting the animal free. He does not look happy to see Mason but turns and wanders back into the jungle without doing any harm after deciding that she is not a threat. Packard, on the other hand, is still hell-bent on putting Kong down. As they're marching through the valley, he and his group notice a giant bloody handprint high up on a nearby cliff, a sure sign that Kong was wounded in their first encounter. He's excited to see that the creature can in fact be hurt, doubling down on his intentions to find the heavy weapons and finish what he started. But some of the men are starting to question whether hunting Kong is really the right thing to do. Everyone else seems to be making progress, but this poor guy Chapman here is still alone, and he's starting to feel like his time might be running out. He tries to reach the others over the radio, but isn't able to get through, leaving him stranded with no idea if he'll ever see his friends again. The man stops for a break, when suddenly, he realizes that the log that he's been sitting on is not a log at all. It's a giant, six-legged insect, and it rears up to attack him as he opens fire on it with his rifle. The bullets don't seem to do much, but for some reason, the creature abruptly retreats into the jungle. It might seem like a good thing at first, but the truth is just the opposite. Just then, he hears a gurgling sound behind him, like a giant amphibian on the hunt, and by the time that he turns around to look, it's already too late. One of the skull crawlers has found him before his unit, and it leaps forward with its jaws opened wide, devouring the soldier before he even has a chance to react.
Okay, man, these things are brutal. Poor Chapman here never even saw it coming, but at least his death was quick, which is probably better than being caught by some of the other creatures lurking on this island from hell. He didn't stand much of a chance as it was, if we're being honest, but it also didn't exactly help that he made himself such an easy target. He fell for the old camouflage trick, and the noise made by him opening fire with the rifle is what ultimately led him to his death. Now, to be fair, it would have been pretty damn hard to tell that that log was actually a giant insect in disguise. But after seeing what went down with Kong and that giant squid by the river, the smart thing to do would have been to always be on your guard until you were miles away from this island, and never get caught just sitting out in the open like you're waiting for the school bus. By now, it should have been pretty damn obvious that everything on this island is trying to kill you. You might better your chances of survival by creating a hideout somewhere overlooking the crash site. That way, you'll be able to avoid any hungry creatures that might come to investigate, but still be close enough to know when the cavalry shows up. Like we mentioned before, I'd attempt to conceal myself visually and by smell if I could to give myself as many chances as possible to avoid any predators. The thing about the skull crawlers is that they also hunt you by sensing your body heat. So the hard truth is that it was probably only a matter of time before he ended up as one's lunch, especially since he was all alone. Still, doing anything that you can to make yourself more difficult to find will go a long way not winding up like Chapman here. Sorry, soldier. Better luck next time. That night, Rhonda pulls Packard aside, urging him to focus on getting to safety instead of killing Kong for the sake of his men. But Packard refuses to give up the fight, seeing this as a chance for personal redemptions after their failures on the battlefields of Vietnam. He's too invested to quit now, and this vendetta is only going to end when he, or the ape, lies dead. The next morning, Conrad and his team are finally able to get the old raft started. As they fire up the engines, Marlow waves a tearful goodbye to the warriors who saved his life so many years ago, and the group sets off upriver, one step closer to getting off this island. It turns out that Marlow here has, or had, a wife and a newborn son back stateside before he was shot down. He's sure that they've most likely moved on, but hopeful for just one chance to see them if he ever makes it home, and it looks like now he just might get his wish. Just then, they're finally able to get through to Packard's team on the radio, and he sends up a flare so that they can find a way to his location. But sure enough, all of this noise draws some unwanted attention. Suddenly, one of the researchers on the boat is grabbed by a flock of petrosaur-like creatures lifted into the air and torn to shreds right in front of them. The others are shocked, but there's nothing that they can do, and their only choice now is to keep moving forward. When Packard and the soldiers arrive at the rendezvous point, they find Conrad and his group already waiting for them. They've taken some heavy losses, and Conrad urges that they need to get to the North Shore as soon as possible, but Packard here is still determined to find Chapman and the heavy weapons. Overhearing this, Marlow points out that in order to reach him, they'll have to walk right into Skullcrawler territory, where they'll most likely all be killed. It's a tough choice, but since they think that Chapman could still be alive, Conrad and his team reluctantly agree with Packard's plan, on the condition that if they don't find him at the crash site, they'll give up the search and focus on getting everyone else out of there in one piece. It doesn't take long before they see why Marlow is so opposed to the idea of going west. As they push towards Chapman's last known position, they come to a mass grave full of the giant skeletons of Kong's family and other enormous species, the work of the skull crawlers. Marlow urges them to turn around, but Packard insists on pushing through and they descend into the Valley of Death, where they will soon come face to face with the most dangerous predators on the island. Okay, Packard is officially losing it, and he's about to lead them straight into a death trap. He may be the man in charge, but they should really listen to Marlowe on this one. After all, the guy has survived on the island for decades, and they've barely made it two days without being completely wiped out. He's not being paranoid when he says to turn back, he just knows that crossing this valley is going to be too much of a risk. The piles of giant bones should make the danger here pretty damn obvious. I mean, one, Kong almost wiped out their entire unit, so anything that can kill an entire family of Kongs should do the same to them without so much of a challenge. There's a difference between bravery and foolishness, and they may be short on 
time, but saving a few minutes on travel isn't going to help if the shortcut ends with everyone being eaten by two-legged mutant amphibians. Instead of cutting through the literal graveyard, I'd suggest finding another way around, or calling it quits and turning back altogether to come up with a new plan. It's a hard choice to leave a man behind, but they need to do what's best for the majority of the team. Plus, if they don't make it off of this island, then nobody's gonna know what's out there, and this whole expedition will have been for nothing. By now, it should be pretty clear that they need to avoid danger at any chance they have. But they're about to walk straight into the Skullcrawler's lair, and it's going to go about as well as you might expect. As they're walking through the graveyard, one of the soldiers throws a lit cigarette, igniting a pocket of flammable gas that goes up in a giant fireball. Rhonda tries warning them to be more careful, but it's already too late. Just then, they hear a scary growl from something big, and Marlo shouts for them to run as they scramble to take cover behind the giant pile of bones. The explosion got the attention of a skull crawler, and as it stalks around searching for them, it stops to vomit up Chapman's skull and dog tags, before disappearing just as quickly as it came. Thinking that the coast is clear, the group starts to move out again, until Rhonda sees something in the reflection of his camera, and a look of terror washes over his face. Suddenly, the skull crawler lunges down, swallowing the man and his equipment whole, only to disappear out of sight once again. But now they can see the flashes from his camera as it circles them in the fog. Marlo readies himself, stepping to the side just as the creature charges towards him and slicing its leg with his sword. The beast crashes past him and begins devouring the soldiers with its long, chameleon-like tongue. They hit it with everything that they've got, but the monster sends this guy with a flamethrower flying dozens of yards through the air, causing an explosion that activates a pack of gas grenades. Okay, well, it looks like Marlo was right after all. Who would have guessed? This thing is going to kill them all if they don't find a way to stop it fast. But it's not going to be easy. It's faster, stronger, and more cunning than anything on this island besides Kong with heightened predatory senses that give it a massive advantage in these low visibility conditions. And worst of all, they're fighting it on its home turf, which means that surviving this battle is going to come down to dumb luck just as much as strategy. Like we discussed before, one of the only ways that I can imagine stopping one of these things is by landing a critical hit to one of its weak points. The survivors should coordinate their fire to focus on its joints to reduce mobility, or on its eyes and thermal sensing pits to counter some of its primary hunting senses. Conventional weapons don't seem to be enough to kill it without sustained heavy fire, and it's probably going to take you out before you can wear it down, but they do work to get its attention. Combine this with its ravenous hunting style, and there just might be a way to take it out quickly. They need to use what's in their environment to their advantage. It might be possible for someone brave to stand in front of one of those sharp bones like a giant rib or the spikes on a triceratops skull and attempt to get it to rush them before before diving out of the way at the last moment, using its momentum to impale it and take it out. It's going to take perfect timing and no small amount of luck, but it just might work. And if all else fails, you can always just hide out and let the others fend for themselves while you sneak away when you get an opening. Drawn to the sounds of the chaos, a flock of the Petrosaur creatures swoops in, and Conrad rushes into the gas cloud armed with Marlo's katana, cutting his way through to one of the injured men. He makes it just as the skull crawler charges towards them, but Mason tosses her lighter into one of the gas vents and blows it up just in time, killing the creature in the explosion. The battle is over for now, but they still have a long way to go, and this skull crawler was only a little one. After the fight, Conrad reveals that the man that they're searching for is dead, but Packard insists that it doesn't matter, still hell-bent on finding the weapons and killing Kong. Marlo and the others have officially had enough, and the situation quickly gets tense, so they agree that Conrad will take the civilians back to the boat, while Packard and his men go to get the explosives. The soldiers eventually make it to the crash site, and begin setting their trap as night falls over the jungle. Meanwhile, Conrad and his group are having trouble finding their way back, so he and Mason set off for higher ground to scout out the area. 
When they reach a high cliffside overlooking the river, Kong suddenly appears from out of the fog, standing directly at eye level with the two explorers. They're terrified at first, but after a tense moment, Mason steps forward and gently places her hand on Kong's snout, forming a bond of friendship with the enormous beast. It's clear that he never meant to hurt them. But just then, the soldiers set off several large explosions to draw him in, and Kong turns to confront them with an angry roar, while Conrad, Mason, and Marlow race to stop the others before it's too late. The soldiers stand their ground as Kong rushes towards them, and at the last second, Packard flings a lit torch into the lake, igniting a pool of napalm that engulfs Kong in flames. For a moment, it looks like their trap might have worked, but it isn't enough to stop him yet, and Kong throws the flames back at them before collapsing from his injuries just a few yards away. With Kong down, Packard commands his men to finish him off with the explosive charges, but that's when Conrad and the others show up just in time, ordering him to stop. One by one, his men begin to turn on him, realizing that Conrad is right, and that Kong would never have been a threat if they hadn't instigated him first. But there are things on the island that they should be afraid of, and the worst one of all is about to show up. Suddenly, there's an explosion from the water, and the Alpha Skullcrawler emerges from the swamp. Drawn in by the sounds of the fight, they stand no chance against this thing and the soldiers all quickly run for their lives, but Packard refuses to quit. As he turns to detonate the explosives, Kong wakes up and instantly crushes Packard with one blow from his massive fist. The insane Colonel is finally stopped, but now they've got an even more deadly foe to deal with. Okay, it looks like old Captain Ahab here finally got what he had coming to him. You can't say that nobody tried to warn him, but he was too blinded by revenge to see the bigger picture. Getting himself killed would have been one thing, but by wounding Kong, he's awakened the most dangerous predator of all. And now, they all might be screwed. Colonel Packard, you f up! To be fair, I can't say that this whole disaster was entirely your fault, but you damn sure played a huge part in it. From the very beginning, you should have ordered your men to fall back when you were getting your asses handed to you by the biggest gorilla that the world has ever seen. Instead, you kept pushing the fight because you were still butthurt about taking a fat L in Vietnam. But maybe it would have been wiser to just accept your losses and quit while you were ahead. Seriously, how many people needed to tell you that Kong wasn't the real threat here before you finally came to your senses? Sure, he killed half of your men, but let's not forget that you were the one who showed up and started dropping bombs on his house. So I'd say that that makes you pretty damn even if you ask me. There's a saying that goes when you seek revenge, you dig two graves. But let's be real, you couldn't dig a grave big enough for Kong if you tried, while he could easily pack you up as nonchalantly as if he was swatting a fly. Sometimes you have to know when to cut your losses and move on, but you just couldn't give it up. And now there's an apocalyptic amphibian about to munch down everyone on the island. Real fine work there, guy. At least your reign of terror is finally over, but Colonel Packard, you f***ed up. The remaining survivors rush to the edge of the island, where Conrad sends Mason to reach high ground and fire a flare to signal the others on the boat, while he and the soldiers hold off the skull crawler. They make their way into the swamp, but that's when this soldier Cole here decides that he's done running. Staying behind, he pulls two hand grenades from his belt, prepared to sacrifice himself so that the others can escape. But instead of falling for the trap, the skull crawler strikes him with his tail, sending him flying into the side of the cliff. The monster closes in on the soldiers, but Kong shows up just in time, leaping down from the cliffs above and slamming the creature over the head with an enormous boulder so hard that it explodes into pebbles. The men run for their lives as the two titans square off, locked in a battle to the death. Grabbing a tree, Kong uses it as a club and breaks it over the creature's head, but it tackles him into a nearby shipwreck, trapping him as he becomes tangled in the anchor's heavy chains. Mason reaches the top of the cliff and fires her flare, alerting the survivors on the boat, who open fire on the monster with their anti-aircraft gun, drawing its attention away from Kong. Distracted by the onslaught, the skull crawler turns and rushes towards them, but Kong rises up from the wreckage and begins to attack it using the propeller from the ship as a massive flail. He throws the beast over his shoulder, body slamming it to the ground before tossing it into the mountainside, but the impact knocks Mason off of the cliff 
and she falls unconscious into the murky water below. Seeing his new friend in danger, Kong reaches down and pulls her up from the water, but the skull crawler attacks again, drawing his entire fist with Mason still clenched inside directly to its jaws. Furious, Kong gathers his strength and tears his arm back out, taking the creature's insides with him as it finally dies and the battle is over. With that, Kong gently places Mason down before turning back to the jungle, having reached an uneasy truce with the humans as long as they stop dropping bombs on his house. The survivors take their boat to the extraction point just as the choppers arrive, and Kong beats his chest, letting out a tremendous roar to show that he's still king of his island. Back in the States, Marlowe finally gets to reunite with his family. But as for Conrad and Mason, the government has other plans. They're taken to the secret Monarch facility, where Brooks reveals that Kong was only one of several titans just like him that are living below the Earth, and they need to start preparing for humanity's next encounter with whichever of these ancient gods rises next. But what do you guys think? It's pretty scary, right? If you were assigned to go to some random island out in the middle of nowhere and immediately upon landing some sh** goes sideways and there's giant freaking monsters, would you hide or fight? Yeah, I know what I would do. Let us know down in the comments below what you would do. Thanks so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. We'll see you in the next video and uh, have a damn good day.